right here. You are tuning in live to Association Chat, your weekly spot for talking, for us talking with trailblazers and thought leaders alike in the association community. I'm your host, Kiki Latalien, and today is a very special Association Chat because unlike most other weeks, we actually have a live studio audience. So can Yay! I hear? <laughs> All right. <laughs> So we are in the lovely studios of Higher Logic in Arlington, Virginia, which is thankfully sponsoring this space for us. We're also working with audience partners who are sponsoring a fantastic happy hour afterwards. So if you are watching from home or your office, I am so sorry that you're going to be missing out on that. Today, though, we're talking about something very important and something that I think uh, a lot of us are concerned about, and that is communication disruption. And I have four thought leaders, four industry trailblazers who are here with me today who are going to talk a little bit about this. We're, we're going to go into hopefully a very meaty discussion, but I want you all to feel very comfortable, as always, to, if you have questions, tweet to A-S-S-N-C-H-A-T, Association Chat. Uh, we have someone live in the audience who is going to be monitoring for your questions along the way, and we'll be taking those as we move on in the discussion a little bit later on. So, without further ado, let's talk about it. Are you ready? Are you ready? Is everyone ready? Yay! All right. <laughs> so, uh, disruption and communication. Are you going to be a disruptor, or are you going to disrupt? Uh, joining me in this discussion is this cross-section of leaders, and we have people who are representing the PR, the uh, marketing industries. We have someone who is representing video and really looking at the forefront of it all. And so let's talk about definition. Let's look at what disruption really means. And I wanted to look at what dictionary.com says that uh, disruption really means. Disruption, noun, a radical change in an industry, business strategy, etc., especially involving the introduction of a new product or service that creates a new market. All right, let's get the wheels spinning. Rob, let's start with you. Does that definition work for you? How, how does it uh, appeal when you start thinking about it as in terms of communications and marketing and associations? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for that question. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. A couple of things occur to me. One of them is, is that um, immediately it's like omnichannel marketing, right? There are a lot of different places out there that we have to make sure that we think about. And it also means, to me at least, that we are, we don't get accustomed to change. We just become change. You know, our organizations are in a constant um, state of evolution, so I don't think we ever become static is one of the ways I kind of interpret, you know, how I take the definition of uh, disruption and then apply it to what I do. Um, we have a lot of conversations thinking about, you know, well, what are we doing today and then what changes are we going to make for tomorrow? Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is, is that we're changing a lot of things today too. So I think that's, you know, for me at least, it's just it's, it's the, an acceptance of the static will never be the case again. All right. So that's fascinating to me. I, I want to bring in another voice. So Rachna, um, you have actually been on a team that is a disruptive team. What you do is disruptive. And so what do you say to that? What, what are your thoughts on disruption? So I co-founded a company called Popbox, and the goal of that is to connect people with their lawmakers in Congress. And what we were finding was you can do that already. You can go find your lawmaker if you know the name of your lawmaker. You can find a bill if you know the bill number. And then do all that research and then write your own letter. Uh, but what we wanted to do was make that easier and make it more accessible to a mass audience. And that, to me, is what disruption is about. How do you make something easier, more effective, hopefully uh, more, more cost efficient, um, but also be able to connect with a broad uh, audience from around the country as well to get them to participate in our national dialogue? Hmm. OK. We have Deb over here who, from her perspective, she's uh, with Center Stage Marketing, and uh, from a PR perspective, you know, 
that's an industry that's gone through a tremendous amount of change. So uh, disruption, new tools, talk to me. What are your thoughts? <laughs> um, yeah, it's like that. Um, it's like that quote from Alice in Wonderland where the Red Queen says, you, you know, in order to stay pla in one place, you have to, you know, you just keep running. And to get anywhere faster, you have to keep running that much faster. So it's, for me, I think it's all about how many different channels there are now than there used to be. There used to be just traditional media channels, and now we have bloggers, and we have Facebook, and we have Twitter. Um, but the one thing that has stayed the same is that it's still all about relationships. It's about how you connect with the media partners that you're trying to, to tell a story to and trying to get to tell your own story. Um, so there's that constant in a sea of new ways of, of getting the word out. Yeah. Okay. And I, I promise we're not going to go, okay, each person has their <laughs> chance. However, that's what I, I just wanted to give everyone a little voice here at the beginning, and then we're going to break it up a little bit. So, Esteban. All right, good. I was feeling left out. I know. I know you were. <laughs> so, videos exploded. Yeah. In turn, and people talk about it. I talk about it being the preferred format for communication. So, disruption inevitably ends up falling at your doorstep, I would yeah. think, right? So, <clears throat> Absolutely. what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's interesting how, you know, at least my perception of disruption has changed so much throughout my life because, you know, my first exposure to disruption was usually in the context of, uh, Esteban, please stop that. You're disrupting the classroom. You know? <laughs> and so it's always like a negative thing, you know? But uh, I mean, these days, disruption, I think, is super exciting. I, yeah. I, I, in most cases, disruption for me is really exciting. I, I, I get really excited when the status quo, the norm, you know, what we've been doing is changed, mm -hmm. you know, and something better. I mean, we all think about it, right? If there was no disruption, we'd be in horse and buggies. We'd be still writing other things. Feathers and paper, you know, I mean, like disruption is what really life and progress is all about. So, first of all, it just really excites me. Yeah. So, you know, for me, like in, in the video world, uh, you know, I got into this industry in, in, in 2004, right in the middle of the whole digital revolution, right, when everything was going from analog where it had been for decades to right. this whole new medium of digital. And, you know, at that time, I had no idea I was disrupting anything. I was just doing what seemed to make sense at the time, you know? And I think a lot of times for disruptors, they don't really realize they're disruptors. They're just kind of taking the next step in a natural evolution of things. Yeah. It's only everybody else that's like, oh no, we're being disrupted, you know? <laughs> and so in that, and so as far as, the, as far as the definition, I think disruption is a very uh, personal thing, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's a person or an industry. You know, what, what's disrupting me right now may not be disrupting Rachna or Deb or, uh, or, or, or um, Rob. Rob. Rob, sorry, that's what you get for not doing it for. It's such a <laughs> Rob. <laughs> you know? um, Esteban. You know, so, so so anyway, so you know, it's 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 there's, there's disruptions that that disrupt all of us. You know, cell phones, smartphones, you know, all that yeah. kind of thing. And there's disruptions that uh, affect us on a very uh, individual uh, basis. So I think it's a very relative term. But yeah, absolutely, the video industry has disrupted and will continue to disrupt just like I think everybody else is here. You know what though? I, I mean, you're right in that, in talking about the fact that disruption, it seems like it's a constant, but that's something I want to talk about too, is that when disruption is a constant, you know, what does that mean? You know, is it something where, when people expect there to be disruption, you know, how, how, do, we, how do we deal with that and stay at the forefront of things in each of our uh, professions and and in what we do every day, and I, you know, you're nodding your head, Rob. Yeah. What, what do you think about that? You know, um, it's funny because a couple things occur to me. One of them is is that I think about when thinking about di disruption with regards to the work itself. Mm -hmm. um, my inflection point is having a holistic uh, perspective as well as a compartmentalized one. You know, we need to be able to, with all the data uh, that we have available to us now. We need to be able to, to look at and we can see the entire environment. At the same time, there are places where we need to focus. And there's a lot of distraction going on, I think, at times where it's like, you know, I want to solve this picture, but actually I want to focus on this one. Or maybe it's the converse of that. And I think that's some of the discipline that it takes in order to be really effective with dealing with seeking better answers because disruption on some level is kind of a reflection of the fact that, you know, everybody in here wants better answers than they got yesterday. 
<coughs> my job is to help deliver those better answers. And the only way that I do that is to compartmentalize the work on some level, but then also to take a holistic view and make sure that I'm working down both of those paths at the same time. I think about it uh, working in T's, mm -hmm. which is why, um, how I frame this, and that is you know, strategic like this and tactical like this. And I mm -hmm. want to make sure that I'm clear about which conversation I am having and what am I trying to achieve as a function of the conversation um, that I'm having too. It, it sounds like that keeps you from being reactionary to yeah. immediate disruptions that are yeah. knocking on your door. Is that true? Yeah, well, I, I should think... be asking the question. No, that's, <laughs> no, that's, that's just kind of what we want. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that because uh, that that is a little bit of what's behind that comment in the sense that, you know, oftentimes, um, I say one of the biggest challenges that I have is what to say no to. And it sounds like a negative, right? It's like, oh my, you don't want to say right. no to anything. You want to, but that's kind of the point. It's like you have to apply some judgment. There are a lot of different options out there. And my hardest job is figuring out and applying the judgment behind the ones that I think are going to really de deliver the outcomes that you know our stakeholders are looking for. But the reality is I don't know that going in because it is such a disruptive um, environment. So there, the answer isn't always clear. So it's, it's interesting to me because you, you came you mentioned uh, coming at it with coming up with better uh, better answers yeah. and something that I've been I've been I've been asking myself similar questions but it's been how can I come up with better questions and that that also is is difficult because it's like you know you go down that path and it never stops right you start asking questions when does it end? Hopefully, if you, if you run out, tell me because I can help you. I've got lots of them. Um, but can you tell good communications disruptions from bad ones? Uh, to, to me, it's um, to me it really comes down to fundamentals. Uh, Deb, you mentioned relationships, and I think almost everything in life comes down to relationships in the end. So you know, while the disruption comes from different tools, different uh, platforms, different technologies, different uh, uh, market situations, you know, all of that, mm -hmm. dis disruption comes out of that. The fundamentals never change, right? Like people never change. Right. So when we think about our audience and what they need from us as communicators or as marketers, um, their needs are the same. So to me, the way to identify a good dis a disruption or one that's going to survive in the marketplace versus one that's not is does it continue to satisfy the inherent needs we have as people and, and, and in communication, in relationships, yep. right? So, I mean, social media is a great example. Social media comes out and everybody says like, great, now I can communicate with 10,000 people at once, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but people have this need to be communicated with on a personal basis, mm -hmm. you know? We, right. we want to feel like we're human beings, not just one of 10,000. So, you know, those th that sprang to that conclusion with, with social media didn't have the outcome that they mm -hmm. wanted, whereas the people that kept that basis, that fundamental, you know, relationship in the middle of their social media activities thrived with the social media pop platform. Yeah, go ahead. And mm -hmm. for us, my clients are in the world of advocacy. They're uh, mm -hmm. issue organizations, trade associations that want their members to connect with lawmakers. And that relationship aspect is not just with the lawmaker, but also with the organization's own membership as well. And that exchange of information, you want them to engage in a campaign to target uh, a policy that's pending um, in Congress, for example. Well, then you need to provide your membership with the proper information and meet them where they are. Don't just use technology for the sake of technology, right. but if your right. members are using that technology, whether it's it's Facebook or Twitter, or whether it's a old-fashioned PDF newsletter, however they process information is where you need to be, and yeah. then building that continued relationship. You ask them to do something and take the time to write a letter to Congress, for example. Well, then tell them how that campaign went and what the results were. And even if it wasn't successful, that interaction helps them become more informed. And next time around you have an ask for them, they're going to follow up and do what you want them to do as an organization. Yeah, I think the piece of the relationship pie is integrity. It's, it's the trust that you're building, whether it's with um, your customers or your stakeholders or the media. It's about that integrity and that what you're telling them is is your story and your truth. 
Mm. You know, when I add to that uh, commentary, both comments there is that, yeah, I think about in communications, um, oftentimes we are trying to, to change or alter behavior. And so one of the things with respect to your question around, you know, how do you tell, right? What's the, what's the right tool or what's the right technique, platform, whatever it may be? I think oftentimes you think about what's the behavior that's already occurring? And mm -hmm. if I'm adding something into that environment, is that going to make that a better outcome? for my stakeholders. So I use this as a quick example, uh, Instagram. So I think it's been around, don't quote me on this, I think it's been around since 2010 or so. The reality of it was is that Instagram in and of itself wasn't particularly unique when it was launched, mm -hmm. right? Um, but what they were paying attention to was the fact that the phones that we all use right now, um, <clears throat> there was an ability to take better quality photos. And that's what was happening. They didn't control that but they walked into the environment when that was occurring. And then they said, you know what, we've got something that can move this further and we're taking that behavior that people want to catalog, want to document their lives mm -hmm. and creating opportunity for them to do that better than they had before. The, the behavior itself wasn't unique, but what they could do with that behavior as a function of Instagrams and offerings is what propelled them forward. So I just, yeah, I think it's the, the, what are those existing behaviors and how do we pay attention to I think good communicators can see, you know, kind of look around the corner, uh, so to speak, and at least have a sense of walking in everyone else's shoes um, and figuring out, okay, what's important? See, I love that. And I would like to build on that and, and ask uh, our other panelists a little bit more about that because with disruption and really, you know, the fact that we're talking about, the fact that disruption is something that's just kind of a given these days, that we are living in an age when society, technological changes are happening so fast that whether something explodes and becomes every day or it just explodes and then diminishes the next day, we don't know. No one, no one really right. knows. And so figuring out what we want to embrace, uh, what could be the next big disruption or uh, figuring out what we need to pass on, that's, that's a very big and very real challenge for anyone who wants to do well yeah. at, their, at their job. So um, I'm going to, to put it to each of you, actually. Um, how do you address that challenge? You know, where do you, how, how do you decide what you're going to move forward with and what you're not? I feel like you spoke to that already, so yeah. Deb. <laughs> Next on the firing line. Nice. <laughs> um, did it get hot in here? Um, you know, it's, that's a really, really great question. Um, and I was mentioning earlier, I work in the theater world, and you would think that we would be one of the first adopters of just about everything, and we're actually not. We're, we're kind of traditionalists um, when it comes to reaching our audiences and reaching the media. Um, and it's about resources, to be quite honest. I mean, if there's a, my feeling is, is, it, is that you take a look at who your audience is. That's the key, is to know who your audience is, is to, and to meet them where they live. And nowadays, the, the theater going, ticket buying public is kind of living on Facebook and a little bit on Twitter. They're not, they're not on Snapchat. Um, they're sort of on Instagram, but, but I think that um, it's about just kind of keeping up with what the next thing is and mm -hmm. evaluating it and knowing whether your audience and th specifically your audience for a given association or a given theater, what, if I can use an analogy from the theater world, and you guys might be familiar with like say Arena Stage versus Woolly Mammoth. They have very, very different audiences. Woolly Mammoth is really edgy and arena stage is a little bit more traditional. And so how they reach out to those audiences is going to be very different. And that's, I think, really the key, is to know who it is you're speaking with. And then, and notice I said with and not to, is <laughs> who you're speaking with. Um, and that's how you kind of stay ahead of the game. There's, think, some, there's some data people in here that probably really appreciate this idea of needing to dig down deeper into knowing exactly <laughs> who your audience is, so, all right. Um, <laughs> Esteban, what do yeah. you think? Um, you know, so, like, when, 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 you're, when we're talking about, like, uh, uh, the disruptive changes, there's so many all the time, like you said, you know, how do you know which ones to jump onto, which ones not to, and, and my feeling really is, for most of the people in our audience, is uh, don't try. Like, mm. you know, I, I feel like hmm. for, for our audience, it's, 
stick to the fundamentals, really know your organization, really know your audience, so that you can come to partners or vendors like me in video or, you know, or many other communication vendors and, and, and let them be the experts in all the new tools and all the new tricks and strategies and all that. L let them handle that. Mm -hmm. You just really know you. And oh, then, oh, so wait, wait. Oh, let's let that sink in. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let, like, let's let that sink in because because what you're saying here, you're not saying we're not paying attention to the edgy stuff. You're not saying mm -hmm. we're not paying attention to where things are growing. Right. You're saying let people be experts where they're experts. Yes. And let you focus. You can't do it all. It, right. I love that. Yeah. I love you, that you, you're saying that. You can't. Do, I mean, there's just so much. I can't do it all, right? I mean, like right. so often uh, clients come to me and expect me to. Be be experts in every level of like communications and video. I can't keep up with this stuff and this is what I do every day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let us do our best with keeping up with it. You do your best with, with keeping up with your organization because there's plenty to keep up with there. Uh, and so find these really good partners in these different niches, if, whether it's SEO or social media or video or whatever it is. And you'll know when it's a right fit because you'll know you so well, yeah, right? Um, right. And, and so and so let them pitch to you. It's It, it really kind of requires opening up and being a little bit vulnerable also to these vendors and really bringing them in as partners, not just I'll tell you when I need you, but letting them see what who you are and who your audience is and what you need. Let them pitch things to you and potential solutions. You'll know when it's right if you really, really know yourself. Mm, that's good. That's good stuff, guys. <laughs> so there's a little to live up to now, right? You've got, you've heard the pressure. Else. Uh, the I know, pressure. but watch now. I know you can do this. Thank you. So <laughs> I'm going, so what everyone else said, but also I'm going to use the analogy that I love to use, which is Henry Ford. So Henry Ford, we all think he said this quote, uh, if we asked people what they wanted, they'd say a faster horse. Actually, yeah. there's no evidence that he actually said it. That was just his philosophy. And then he started making these Model Ts in mass production. But what happened was um, in the 1920s, Alfred Sloan came around, uh, General Motors, which we've all heard of. His model wasn't, oh, we aren't going to ask people what they want. His model was the opposite. It was customer driven. And he looked at what people actually wanted. And if you asked people what they wanted, they wanted a better car. They didn't want a faster horse. So he created the slogan, a car for every purse and purpose. And this was at a time when Ford had two thirds of the car market in the United States. Within five years or so, Ford's car share market went down to 15% mm. from two thirds because Alfred Sloan was asking the right questions, not only at the beginning, but then continuing to ask the questions of his audience. And what he found was it wasn't just about a better car, but also better financing. He created the uh, used car trade-in uh, model and uh, new purchase plans that allowed people uh, to get cars affordably. And then also he created a new model of car every single year, whereas Ford had to shut down operations temporarily to transition from the Model T to the Model A. So what we want more of is a Sloan type of, of thought process when it comes with interacting and knowing your, knowing your audience, as um, De Deb and Esteban both said, uh, and meeting them where they're at and what their needs are. Wow. So, I mean, is this a shock to some people? Did we not, I mean, wow, Henry Ford, and now, now Sloan is gonna be the guy. That, yeah, I don't um, even remember Ford, who's Ford? Right? Yeah, yeah, right. Ford. <laughs> he didn't do anything. So, and and Roger nah. makes, uh, makes a great point that, um, you know, and I think it's even gone further than that, today where like the famous Steve Jobs quote was where, is that what you were going to I was thinking out in right? my head right? like, <laughs> like, and then you know, focus what you need <laughs> if you're waiting for your audience to tell you what they right, want right. you're probably yeah. too late because yeah. it's probably mainstream and then yeah. like you said Rob yeah, yeah. We, everybody else has moved on by that point yeah. right? right I mean it's, all, it's an ever, everlasting evolution right. so right. really right. we need to be thinking about you know uh, 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 what are they going to need next and looking at behavior more than waiting right. for their responses uh, Steve Jobs' quote was, you know, why they don't do focus groups is why he was asked. He said, because people don't know what they want until you show it to them. Right. <laughs> and, uh, right. You know, one other thought that occurs to me, another layer here is that <clears throat> I think about, because you know, everybody's familiar with the concept of brainstorming, right? Well, we, we use something called brain writing. It's just an extension of that. Mm -hmm. But the point of it is, is that 
we are relentlessly focused on what is the objective that we're trying to solve. And it sounds kind of dull and boring, but the reality is, is that I see disruption and then I use creativity as the answer. Mm -hmm. And creativity is hard and it gets much harder when it's not all of these ideas, but rather the best ideas. And I see it break down a lot of the time um, where we get this, you know, a you know, range of 10 to 20 ideas, let's say. And we get to get, we start to get some buy-in on it. You know, it might be personality driven, it might be presentation driven, it might be a number of things, you know, these other kind of dynamics that, that influence, you know, the excitement around a particular idea. And then we stop. Mm. And it's like, that's where it starts. You know, that's how, you know, for the things that I know all of us do and what, you know, how we've been trained, is that that creativity, you have to refine it and it gets refined based on what am I trying to achieve with it? What impression do I want? What kind of, what, what impression do I want Kiki to have? Mm -hmm. You know, and if I can get focused on that and get all of us really dialed in on that, you know, over the course of some time, then we're going to get to that best idea and that's going to help us navigate what to put on a plate versus what take, to take off the plate. Yeah, well, you know what that makes me think, though, is what if somebody's out there and they say, I want to be more creative, I want to be a disruptor, I want, I want to be the, be the change, right? Um, what then? What, what can people do in that regard where they can, they, they want to be the disruptor, not the disrupted, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I think for uh, a lot of people with ideas, it's really important to know the problem. Mm -hmm. And when I was trying to come up uh, with ideas to make Popbox work, it was about my own frustration with advocacy because I had been a lobbyist and I was really frustrated with the way people were interacting or not interacting with Congress. So for me, the problem was real because I was experiencing it every day. So I wanted to create a company that was solving the problem that I was dealing with all the time. And I think that the most, uh, the, the the true disruptors often come from a place of, I'm trying to solve this specific problem, and then they go test, retest, and, and refine that so they understand all the use cases possible, and then move on from there to, mm -hmm. to start disrupting what it is that they yeah. um, are trying to do. There are a lot of, just for the people watching from home and from your offices, there are a lot of nodding heads I've seen here. Does everyone pretty much agree with that? They're like, yeah, yeah you're looking for... I've seen a few high fives. <laughs> <laughs> I thought someone's there. throwing out $100 <laughs> bills. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, but I mean, I, I, I really do see that where it is. You're trying to solve those problems and you're, you're asking those questions. Like, where are the problems? So identifying the problems, that's one thing. Yeah, yeah Esteban. I, I just read this uh, uh, book, Richard Branson, uh, um, The Virgin Way or A Virgin Way? I don't remember, but it, Richard Branson, yeah. Virgin. <laughs> um, and the, uh, it's really interesting. You know, the, the name Virgin, um, where that came from, was that Richard Branson's whole thing in creating this brand was we're going to enter industries as a virgin. No exposure. We're going to come in. We're not going to look at what anybody else has done. We're going to come in and say, if I'm, a, if I'm a consumer in this industry, what do I need to feel safe, to feel good, like Ma, uh, Maslow's hierarchy yeah, of needs, right? Yeah. You know, like, what, what do I need here? And, and a lot of them are really simple because we're all consumers every day. We get on airplanes. And so he started, you know, the Virgin Atlantic and Virgin America. We all, you know, uh, get books. So he started Virgin Publishing. But he came into these not trying to one-up anybody else, mm -hmm. just saying, get everybody else out of the way. How would we do it right? Mm -hmm. And starting there. Because I think if you really look, if you look at what everybody else is doing, first of all, you're looking at the past, right? And second right. of all, it's just so much clutter, right? And you're trying to find, you know, uh, leave all that out of the way and, and and just and just find the right way to do it, regardless of what anybody else is doing, and and and, and follow that path. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the the willingness <coughs> to to look, you know, and be open to different ideas. So there's this old example of um, you know a hospital room, emergency room, and they were looking to determine how they could get faster at the process, right? And what they did was, instead of going around the country to a number of different emergency rooms, they went to NASCAR. And they looked mm -hmm. at how NASCAR is able to do their wow. pit stops. That's you the know? best. Wow. And that's, you know, and that's how they found a better solution. So I think it's, you know, to your point, I agree with it wholeheartedly. It's, you know, being open to, but then also willing to take the steps to be exposed to things that seem, you know, contrary and that seem, you know, that seem disruptive. That actually might be disruptive in activity, but you also have to be disruptive, disruptive in thought too. And I think that's an important um, you know, aspect of what you're sharing. Hmm. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> and 
I think the goal isn't just to be disruptive. There's such a thing as uh, sustaining innovation and how to make things even better. And mm -hmm. we see that with like the quality of our televisions. They've gotten bigger and clearer and the blacks are darker. Like, you know, that stuff is just better quality. That's nothing disruptive. It's just right. providing something that's better. And that's what made yeah. me um, think of it, your example. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, my husband buys these razors, right? It's like Gillette, and it has five blades now, <laughs> whereas the old-timey razors had just one blade. And then, then it has this swivel head yeah. thing. Don't forget and the vibration. Some of them have the vibration. No, don't, uh, don't, don't tell him about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably wow. like 100 bucks each, right? So, so, but whenever I look at that, I think, wow, somebody had this idea of how to make a razor better by adding more blades. And this you know, but You thing. know what that makes me think of? That makes me think of the Starbucks story where they were, they were crowdsourcing uh, ideas for how to make things better and the little green things that you stick mm -hmm. in so you yeah. don't spill your drink yeah. all over everything. Mm -hmm. Those little green, pe they're straight pieces. Let's talk about how complicated this is, guys. They're straight <laughs> little pieces with a stopper <laughs> that goes in. How many of us have spilled coffee on ourselves after we went, you get it and it's awful and it's terrible and you've spent like $5 million on it and you're really upset about it. And they come up with this solution, but really, is that disruptive? It might seem like it, but no, it's not. It's 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 solving a problem. Um, so, so real quick, where I thought you were going with that rationale, which is really interesting, um, <laughs> was Dollars Shave Club. Has yeah. anybody heard yeah. of that? Right. right. So, yeah. Yes. So right. they, okay. I feel like, are a disruptor. Like they right. didn't yes. add more. They didn't add a six blade. What right. they said was like. All right, how about you pay us a dollar a month and we'll send you a simple blade once yeah. a month. You don't have to go to the store anymore, Girls right? And, guys. and they yeah. just say, right. yeah. yeah, and they just yeah. super simplified the whole concept. Yeah. Right. And, and I mean, really is an incredibly basic idea, but a huge disruption just because they weren't trying to one up. They took a fresh new approach. Right. right. Yeah. I think about how they, you know, because that's what I thought you were going as well. So now that you've gone, good path. 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 And they talked about refining it from a price standpoint because that was the, the, the issue there. Gillette, you know, was a you know, fantastic product that owned the market, the majority of the market share by far, but it was very, very expensive. Right. Yeah. And no one was saying that, but yet they were, so these you know, Dollar Shave Club, Club jumped in and said, wait a minute, we can get almost the same level of quality with our German manufactured blades and we can give, you a, give it to you probably a third of the price. That's, you know, that's a function of trying to figure out what is that behavior and how you actually refine that innovation um, in a way that's productive for the consumer. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah. I, I love that example. I think it's fantastic. And the interesting thing is almost nobody does the $1 plan. Right. Like that's right. what they exactly. sell, but yeah. everybody yeah. gets the yep. 5 7 or $15 plan or whatever right. they right. have, you know. It's uh, still cheaper than 30 though, which it's is right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, when you go into the supermarket, they kill, they put those things under lock and key razors. Yeah, they they do. Do. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's always my first. But they're beamed down from heaven now, so they need to <laughs> 5 billion blades. Okay, so um, <laughs> cars to razors, what's next? I know. So what's next? Let's it's association chat. So I need to bring this back to associations and say Rob. Somehow. Rob. <laughs> <laughs> is radical change, is disruption happening in the association space that you see? Ah. And if so, from what to what? Like, what, what is that change? What is that disruption that you're seeing? If that's you're seeing any at all. That sounds like a semi-loaded question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whose perspective should I answer that from? Now, <laughs> I, um, I think it is happening. Uh, I think that you know there are a number of ways that it's happening. So first and foremost for me is that you know I think of these uh, concentric circles, right? <clears throat> so the broad circle is uh, consumer behavior out here. Mm -hmm. And then you know, as we get a little bit closer to associations, you know, we're talking about our folks, our people who are, you know, certainly consumers first and then association consumers second, tertiary, you know, on down. Um, and they have the same expectations. And I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. I love that actually. That makes it, you know, incredibly fascinating because as an example, you know, we're going to, let's say we go to Amazon. Right? Mm -hmm. So there's a very good digital experience, whether you love or hate Amazon, they deliver products pretty quickly, pretty seamlessly, um, mm -hmm. at a fairly good price. You know, doesn't mean that's you know, true across the board, but there's some things they've, they've routinized to the extent that it works pretty well. 
and I think you know in the association space we're dealing with those types of expectations we may not characterize them that way all the time but I think that's precisely what they are and I think that's a tremendous opportunity for us uh, because we can then use what's been happening out here and then figure out well what part can we actually play in many mm -hmm. of us aren't going to have those types of resources but you know to your earlier comment I believe um, it's not always about the resources you know it's about the thought behind it Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a tremendous opportunity. So, you know, how I'd relate that to associations more specifically is, is that I'll use um, one of our products as an example, uh, Springtime, something that I'm sure a lot of folks here, have, you know, probably participated in the past, has been around for a number of years, and it is no longer. Uh, we got rid of Springtime. I didn't know that. You didn't know that's that. A, uh -oh. I mean, I'm behind the times. <laughs> yeah, so, no, yeah. no, no. Well, I'm glad we had the conversation. <laughs> 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 okay, okay. Don't go to springtime this year. <laughs> okay, I'll be waiting. Right, right, right there. Uh, it is not there. Yeah. Um, but we've got, we're coming to market with an entirely new product, mm -hmm. right? And um, it's called XDP. So this will be a promo for XDP. But the point of it is, is that it's serving a broader springtime was designed to primarily service meeting planners, uh, mm -hmm. meeting you know, M&E departments. Um, XDP is really positioned to serve all the folks, all the disciplines in an association that put on a meeting. Mm -hmm. And it's also a co-created, co-collaboration type of event. So it's a very different, uh, very different structural event. My point in bringing that up is that we were feeling and seeing you know, a lot of things happening in the meeting space writ large. We are, ASAE is clearly supportive of meetings writ large as we need to be and we should be. Um, <clears throat> that said, there are changes that are happening out there. You know, we think about, I know for those in the space, uh, host buyer programs really kind of jumped up into the, uh, into the environment a few years ago. And that was creating some, some um, dis I guess, not discord certainly, creating some angst. Yeah, yeah, I think it would probably be a good yeah. term to use because it was just some, there was some uncertainty. And it's not a, this isn't a commentary on hosted buyer. Now, what it is is a commentary on there are different answers out there. Mm -hmm. And so we're in a position of needing to reflect what's most important to folks and try to get that as right as possible. So our first foray into an entirely different meeting format for ASA will be XDP. Um, hopefully it'll go off fantastically well. Obviously we wouldn't be doing it if we didn't believe that. But um, it's a function of looking at that portfolio writ large. You right. know, and understanding it, where are the gaps in that portfolio from an audience standpoint, from an outcome standpoint as it relates to the things that uh, people want to, um, what they want to achieve. So there's, there are a lot of different answers there, but, you know, to, your, to answer your question, I do think the association space is in the position of not only seeing um, disruption, but also having to, to manage and create better solutions as a consequence, because that is a microcosm of what's happening at large. Okay, so how, how are you guys feeling at home? I want to check with the people. Us usually, you know, when, when I'm doing these weekly chats, I see a little sidebar of people commenting, <laughs> giving me feedback. And so, and our audience is so graciously, they're listening and, and intently, I hope. Uh, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for, the, for the folks at home, you know, if you're not tweeting, if you're not sending us your thoughts, I want to encourage you, please, send your questions, your thoughts, your feedback to hashtag A-S-S-N-C-H-A-T. Um, and I'm going to check in with Lara over here. How are, we, how are they doing so far? Do we have any questions, any comments? Yeah, we have one question from Daryl Walter. Daryl Walter? Yes. Okay. He said, Amazon has disrupted retail more than any other company. How can associations disrupt a typical conference and membership? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, and, and that's a really good question. And yeah. I feel like that speaks to, I mean, you kind of spoke to that just now, but did you have any additional thoughts on that? Uh, great question, yeah. uh, first of all. Yeah. So uh, thank you for the question. Thank I you, think, um, Yeah, what occurs to me quickly is that how, you know, I think associations are in, it's having worked in the for-profit arena for a long time, I think that associations have to, are in a position of having to adapt a lot of the practices that are in the for-profit arena, but you also kind of come up short a little bit, and we need to, mm -hmm. um, in the sense that there's also, we've got our stakeholders now, let's talk about volunteers, you know, mm -hmm. board members, that have a take on what the organization really are directing the organization now from a strategic standpoint. And so to that end, yeah, we're having to develop products and services that meet the needs of the broader membership. We're also having to develop products and services that meet the needs of those volunteers. And that's not always aligned. 
you know, I think that makes it a little bit challenging and interesting for associations. So when you start thinking about launching new products, a lot of that new product launch activity is based on making sure that there's enough buy-in to launch it in the first place. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's really, really important. You know, in the other arenas, it's not that it's done, it's, it's not that it's not done, rather. Um, you're always talking to your audiences, but you're talking to them differently. So I happen to be intrigued by that because I think it's an interesting interaction. But um, you know, we're talking about change. I mean, it's it's a big deal, and, and mm -hmm. it's sometimes hard, and it's really about culture sometimes um, and process as much as it is the outcome of the change. Yeah, and, and the question was in case people didn't hear on the webcast about Amazon having disrupted and how can meetings, you know, yeah. and and and, and um, uh, uh, association events be disrupted like that? And you know, one thing that I know Amazon does, we actually. Uh, uh, long story, but we know somebody that works or used to work for Amazon, and used to tell us all these kind of back backdoor things that they do, which are really interesting. Again, they, you're going to be sad you're missing the happy hour. They, they, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, but they actually track like where your mouse moves at all times. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. they know where you're going on that page. Wow. They know what you were about to click on but decided not to. They know it caught your eye. They are trying to be able to see your retinas from your webcam so they know right. where you're looking on the page and things like that, which I think is getting into some privacy yeah. issues, yeah. but <laughs> that, that's, that's, true, in the, yeah, that's, that's, that's in the background. Of, that's what yeah, they yeah. want to be able yeah. to do. Right. So, to, so to me also, and, and I don't have nearly the experience, Rob, that you do in associations or anything else, but my perception, kind of getting in here late in the game the last decade, is that you know, this was largely a one-way street, kind of association mm -hmm. speaking to their members, right? You know, so the members, the biggest value was that we as the association have the information you need, and that is what you are paying us for. That information's available on the internet these days, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the information oh, by itself, to me, doesn't, doesn't justify the, the membership fee. So to me, it's finding new ways of creating value, and for me, it's the feedback loop, right? It's, it's, it's what Amazon's doing on their website of, of, of tracking every, every movement and, and, and blip you make, um, by having that kind of feedback from your audience. And, and, and there are organizations that do that with like yeah. big data. We got Bear Analytics here, Eric's here. Um, <laughs> you know, th that's what they do. And, and you know, so, so wrapping that kind of all together, I think that feedback loop is, is super important and really making it a two-way conversation constantly. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where I think the new value will be for associations is forming kind of this club versus a funnel going down, out to your membership. Yeah. And even more simply, using that Amazon example, you know when you are buying something on Amazon and you put it into your cart and then suddenly it's, it shows you other things that you could buy because other people bought something similar to that? Well, using that model is a great extension for how to e engage more people uh, in your association or organization. So for example, if they participated in something or they read uh, a FAQ that, that was uh, provided by the association or they participated in an action, well, why not follow up and send them something similar and try to see what works and what what creates more engagement mm -hmm. and that yeah. creates that feedback loop where they feel that you're suddenly providing them with so much more information based on what they have already selected that they're interested in yeah. uh, and I think tracking that data would be vital as well because then you can you can anticipate their needs uh, even better uh, and also for associations especially uh, we're having more and more millennials in our workforce, and uh, not only as entry-level positions, but moving up the ranks. So how do you engage them in their, uh, in their own special way? And how, um, how do you make sure that they get the mentorship um, to, to engage further and become the future leaders of the association as well? Well, I wanted to, um, this, this actually makes me think of a discussion that I, I was fortunate enough to attend AMS Fest last week, uh, which was held in, in DC. It was a great discussion about uh, single sign-on and APIs, and really the whole idea behind it was looking at ways to improve um, the customer experience, you know, and, and with an eye toward Amazon and Uber and looking at, you know, all of the all the usual suspects in, in the idea of improvement and disruption and customer service. And I think that so many of our members, clients, customers are searching for that. Of course, we want to be Amazon. Of course, we want, we want their money. We also want to provide the good customer success, right? Yeah. 
Um, so we want to we want to provide good customer service, but we don't start with the same kind of funding, with the same kind of budgets that a lot of them have. So uh, is anyone? Really I think the I think the funding comes because they have great ideas. I don't think it's okay. they get funding and then they come up with great ideas. Okay, so, so chicken I, or egg, you're I'm saying a little bit the on that side. Yeah. The funding I think what a lot of these organizations like like Uber and you know a lot of the ones you mentioned, Airbnb, you can make a big list of, yeah. of these and kind of the, the it's been called the trust based economy or the sharing economy or whatever else, is a I, I think a they're all based in a fairly simple fundamental thing, which is the organization trusts the cons consumer first. And that is a really counterintuitive idea in the traditional economy, where yeah. the, 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 the business or the organization held all the cards and you could kind of get a piece of that if you paid. And now it's, you know, we trust you, we trust you're going to be responsible, we trust you're going to, you know, uh, 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 be a good steward of this service. And what's really interesting is when you are genuine and authentic and you extend that trust to somebody else, the natural human response is to is that you have something of value that you want to protect. And so you want to take care of that trust. And so you give that trust right back to them and you and you fulfill their expectations. And so I think that's a big shift. I'm not, and this is kind of goes beyond associations. This is just everywhere mm -hmm. that I think the whole economy is going towards uh, organizations really being the first to step out and trust their consumers um, that they're going to do the right thing and enabling them to do that. Um, and uh, it's a slippery slope, I'll be the first to admit. Yeah, but, but, right. but I mean, that, that's where these organizations have seen their success, is, is in that fundamental shift. So Deb, what do you think in your situation, I mean, when you're looking with your clients and, and the, the work that you're doing, do you see that being the case? And, and how are you, you helping them, you know, when you're, when you're facing uh, disruption or potential disruption and trying to help them along the way? Um. I think I think the the first thing I tell them to do is breathe <laughs> because <laughs> you must be in theater. <laughs> Deep puns and breaths, um, and I and and honestly, it, it is kind of like that because the the times that I get called um, is when there's a theatrical emergency. So. Um, you say every emergency I have is the <laughs> <laughs> um, No, I think that um, the thing to remember is that is is the other trust piece of it is that you also have to trust in your product. You have to trust in what it is you're providing mm -hmm. to your consumers or your stakeholders or your volunteers. You have to have that belief in it. Um, and then from that, it's very, very easy to be, as you said, authentic because you feel strongly about what it is you're doing, you feel strongly about what it is you're providing. Um, and so that's, the, that's kind of the constant reminder is that to, is to just get back to the basic of, we're, you know, we know what we're doing, we're putting on a show, we're providing an escape for people, and, um, and to stay true to that and not to try to be like everybody else or not try to jump on a bandwagon but to stay true to what it is you're you're doing and what you're providing and really knowing that intrinsically yeah i, I saw i saw there is some there's a light in your eyes at the end <laughs> of your <laughs> i can't help it it starts popping off <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, i think um, i love this comments because i think that you know what occurs is that there's in associations um, i characterize it in the following fashion um, and that is aligning business outcomes with value-based outcomes. Mm -hmm. And there's this term of social entrepreneurs. You see a lot of organizations, you know, what's, what's a good one? Um, Warby Parker, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, right? So mm -hmm. there's, um, and there's a lot of funding <laughs> that's available for those types of organizations. I see organizations like that of kind of playing in the association space with respect to, you know, the things that they're doing and how they go about doing it. They understand that there are consumers out there that will consume good products when they have a social responsibility perspective to it. Mm -hmm. And associations, by default, that's what we do. We're cause-related, right? And so I think it's the, and I think the, the next, well, it's not that it's not happened, but I think it has to happen more in the future, is the alignment of those two things. You know, you talk about the resources, right? So, yeah, we talk about Amazon. So what, I, what occurs to me with Amazon, it could be a number of things, but two would be, you know, uh, customer loyalty programs, Amazon Prime. 
Mm -hmm. Second one would be that it's interesting that, you know, I think most of us, um, from what I understand, um, you know, from a research standpoint, struggle with getting information from our consumers, our stakeholders, our members, what have you. Um, Amazon probably doesn't struggle with it all that much because they have to provide you know, a certain amount of information in order to gauge in the first place. So mm -hmm. why is that? Why is it that people are willing to give up that kind of very personal information because they want something, because they, are, they can achieve something at a better uh, level than they could absent that? So then they don't care. We give up information all the time, all of us do. I use Uber to get over here. They have a whole bunch of data on me, right? I don't care because I get great service. You know, so <laughs> I, yeah. you know these are yeah. these are kind of these uh, inflection points that I think are really important for associations and you know maybe all of us to get um, to have some clarity on. I don't have all the clarity, but I, I think at least I understand some of the places to look for it, um, and that's one of the places I look. Well, and the other thing with Amazon too is that even as a consumer, you're asked to be invested in them. Um, you know, I every time I make a purchase, they ask me how it how it went. Right. And, and then you also see on the reviews that there are, there are, I don't know, influencer reviewers. Like there are people that review on Amazon all the time. Yeah. And so I think that um, that kind of, I mean, I always get, that's the first place I think to buy something is Amazon. Yeah, it's the easiest. The yeah. other quick bond is that when you just mentioned it, yeah, social proof as mm -hmm. relates to Amazon, right? So yes. if I don't know anybody that's experienced this product, all I have to do is look at the reviews, mm -hmm. and there's my social proof. You know, we use that, you know, we've begun to use yep. that much more at ASC than we have in the past for that very reason. You know, we want people to know, hey, how is this product reviewed? You can hear it from us, but more importantly, hear it from people who are interested in the same product. Yep. Simple things. Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely fascinating. I see that you're, what, so. Oh, please. You need a buzzer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, no, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in the queue. Yeah. Uh, also, there's, an aspect in membership organizations like associations where people have expertise. Your members have a lot of expertise like that point. you can learn yeah. from. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the associations don't necessarily draw from that expertise. Mm -hmm. And not only does it create buy-in for the organization, but also it expands that, no that knowledge. Oh, and yeah. that yep. power mm -hmm. of storytelling um, can really make a difference. But see, you know, this is a fascinating, I, okay, let's just face facts. There's eight minutes left of this, <laughs> of this conversation. But that's a, it, we're going down a fascinating path for me because I came from working in the association, at four associations, to um, working on the industry provider side of things, so doing consulting work. And I have to say, and I, I am, I am a chronic volunteer for my professional home, which is ASAE. Um, but I ha you know, I think that associations face this constant. I understand. I've worked for them. I, I get it. You know, everyone, we're wearing multiple hats. No one can do everything. If we're supposed to stay on top of stuff, mm. if we're supposed to stay ahead of the game, and and be innovative and disruptive and do all of these things that we're supposed to do you know, and our jobs, which we're probably doing five jobs for like the one position that we have. Um, you know, how, how are we supposed to do that first and foremost? And then, and then what? We're supposed to go and be able to comb through our, um, our membership and identify the opportunities and put the right people in the right places. And I see this as an issue because what I see, it's with brainstorming too, is vocal, visible people get chosen always, first and foremost, because mm. it's easiest. It's the easiest thing for us to do, for anyone. Uh, but associations, I feel for it, because I get it. I get that you want to go for the raised hand. Mm. They have the qualifications. They're passionate. Of course you want to help them out. I mean, that's what you're there for. So there's a challenge there for sure. Do we have any questions from the audience? I want to make sure that uh, we get those questions for you online who are watching live? No questions, any comments? Um, well, online, um, Jay wanted to ask, what are the resources the panelists use to expose themselves to new ideas? Publications, podcasts, conferences? Oh, that's a great wow. question. So resources, uh, I love this question. So awesome, Jay, Jay, uh, Rob? Sure. Um, you know, all of the above. <laughs> but, you know, more specifically, um, I'm a, a Flipboard junkie. Oh. And okay. I just, you know, I go through there and I, I give them my interests and sometimes I change them. But I can comb through that, you know, at every kind of, uh, 
waking moment. I think sometimes in between the waking moments, honestly, it's just a, it's just the first thing I reach for. What's going on? And it's just yeah. I, I love it because I can talk about it. I can find topics um, around content marketing as an example. I can find mm -hmm. topics around branding. Um, I can find talk topics around um, storytelling. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things we talked about earlier with regards to resources is that exposure to other things. And so there's, you know, the lane that I play in is the lane with regards to the subject matter that I'm most interested in because that's what I do. Um, there are other lanes that I have to play in in order to be effective. Um, so it's reading things that have nothing to do with my job, that have nothing to do with anything related to marketing or communications, and has everything to do with understanding the human condition. Mm. Understanding how people think, what's the, what are the emotional things that happen with all of us, and how do we show up and utilize that and use that throughout our lives? Those answers are in a variety of different environments. Um, I, you know, uh, Raj, I appreciate you uh, mentioning uh, the fact that um, you know our members, all of our members, right, who are in associations, are incredible resources. So another resource for me is reaching out to members that I'm connected with and just asking. You know, sometimes asking about what we're doing, but mm -hmm. sometimes just asking. You know, having nothing to do necessarily with a, a project or something we're working on, but rather, how are you feeling about, you know, this activity? Or how are you feeling about mm -hmm. ASC and your interaction writ large? Whatever it might be. Um, the other place is certainly other peer groups. I'm involved in a, uh, recently involved in a CMO um, network, which I'm very excited about because they're CMOs from associations, but mm -hmm. also from some of the major 100s, uh, Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 organizations too. So that's a place where I've already begun to um, experience a lot of benefit because it just forces me to think about things differently. So mm -hmm. those are the things that kind of pop into mind for me uh, yeah. with regards to resources. Those are great. Those are great. Deb? Yeah, peer groups are great. I mean, the, the publicists and the theater industry here, we get together and chat and commiserate. Um, the other thing that I'm a fan of are hashtags. I have streams that I follow, whether it's PR pros or PR tips or... Ass and chat. Yep, yep. ass and chat. <laughs> yep. So, and it's great because inevitably I will find an article that speaks to what I'm doing or speaks or tells me about something that I hadn't ever heard of before. Um, so those are the two things that really, really help me out because I, I just, I'm always trying to come up with what's this, what's the next story that I need to tell. Um, one other thing about that that I just want to throw in there is, is um, just from a um, putting your story out there perspective. Um, I think that it's also helpful to see what, what the bigger stories are and how you can be a part of them, mm -hmm. too. Um, just because I think sometimes we stay in our lanes, just right. as you said, and we aren't looking at what the larger, possibly the larger stories are that you can be a part of. I like that. I like that. Esteban? Yeah, I wish I had a more profound thought than these two. <laughs> but, um, you know, Rob, point you made earlier, you know, about taking uh, really innovative ideas from, from different industries and adopting mm -hmm. them. And I think a tendency is to kind of isolate ourselves. And even if you don't isolate mm -hmm. yourselves uh, in, within your organization, maybe you branch out into your industry. But uh, I know, speaking for myself, you know, when I went to a lot of as uh, association meetings and things within my industry, I actually felt like I was being held back. Mm -hmm. Like they, they didn't... They didn't like the disruption in me, right? Because that You're so that, was, disruptive that wasn't <laughs> that, that wasn't good for them, it. right? For me to for me to do things differently, or for me to engage clients differently, or provide like that. You know, it's like no, no, no. Come come, come on back to the flock. You know, let's mm -hmm. let's stay in the safe little spot over here. Um, whereas really branching out and 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 going into other industries and finding partners that do similar things, mm -hmm. but really creative things that we don't do. Yeah. And you know, and and. Um, uh, you know, like we're, we, we've been working um, a lot with audience partners, uh, Peter here, uh, who will be hosting the happy hour afterwards. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like being able to take our content, right? We create great content. Great. So what do you do with it, right? And being able to actually take that and then get it in front of the right people at the right time on the right platform, narrowing down that demographic, having a natural feedback loop that people don't even know that they're in so that we get to know our audience better than anyone else or our client's audience, mm -hmm. and then we can continue to improve their content in ways they didn't even know they needed to do or, or, or you know, could do. Right. Um, we can't do that by ourselves. We need people that are really smart and experts in other places. And so mm -hmm. we've made a big push in the last few years to, to, uh, to surround ourselves by those types of people. And uh, we don't try to do it all under our brand. 
you know? So when a client comes to us, we say, hey, we've got all these great partners. Let's, you know, bring them to the table too and see what we might be able to come up with and collaborate together. And so I, I really think if you're trying to kind of control the whole experience and control the customer and, and all that, you're really isolating yourself. You're going to be kind of uh, left behind. And I think in this day and age, it's really widening out. Mm. Okay. Mm. And so I have to say, Rachna, you've got to bring it to the you got to bring it now. So resources. <laughs> I know. Aren't you glad you sat next to me? Because then I can just. I mean, <laughs> you shining these lights. Ah, I can't take it. The heat. So, my <laughs> no, I meant your. No, I'm, I'm, good. <laughs> I'm good. Cheers. No, I'm shining. So my one big takeaway in my experience coming from the association world and then starting Popbox was just ask. Ask your users, ask your audience, ask your members, hey, what do you think about whatever? And they are the biggest resource. For me, that means asking my clients about a new feature, a new product. And I literally can show them the mock-up and say, hey, what do, you, what do you think about this? Does this make sense? And go through it with them and get feedback from them as we develop things, as we develop a new tool or a new feature on Popbox, uh, and that has really helped create better products and create a better relationship as well. And I have never, and this surprises me, I've never been turned down from anyone when I said, hey, can I have a half an hour of your time um, to help me with this new feature or product? They have never turned me down, and that really surprises me because it feels like we're here in Washington, D.C., and it's very based in tradition and politics feels like a zero-sum game and people might not want to help each other out. But actually mm -hmm. when you ask, people want to help each other and that's the beauty of working yeah. with associations. Uh, and um, we got to stick together. So. Are, you, are you getting chills? Because I'm, feel, I'm <laughs> feeling this. This is, Warm actually, and fuzzy. this is good. No, this is, and I really, you know, everyone here is here because someone asked them to be. They graciously accepted. They're not getting paid to be here. Sorry, guys. Maybe next time. <laughs> and uh, and and the thing is, though, is that it, it really is. If you put that ask out there, it, you would be shocked at the information that you can get, the help you can get. And I think that that's really what communities, online communities, association communities you know, those people around us, what we can really do. So I appreciate your time here. Everyone, what do you think? What do you, I mean, how was it? How was it online? Yeah. Oh, standing ovation. No, it's not. But, but I mean, I, I really have to say thank you. This has been a phenomenal experience. Uh, Five O'Clock Films and Media just knocked it out of the park with their work. And all of the panelists, I have to say, thank you for taking your time to join us for association chat. And we'll see you next Much time. Muted applause on the whole panel. <laughs> muted <I know>. <laughs> 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 All right. We'll see you next week. And this will be online later, right? This yes. will we'll yeah, be, be on posting this online. You can find it at associationchat.com and we'll be tweeting it. Follow the hashtag. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>